Christian's appearance at various flood points buoyed the spirits of many, still trying to cope with their losses. As in Winslow, where Kathy Genthner reported to us on severe damages. This is Lithgow Street, where the Kennebec thrusted the most furor, wiping out an entire neighborhood of eight homes. People here just pick through the rubble in silence. Libby lived at 23 Lithgow with her husband Harry and her daughter Nancy. From Nancy's room we went into my kitchen and that little room over there would have been the bathroom. Actually we're standing in the living room. We can stand a little bit of water. You got a house to go back to. I don't have a house to go back to. I don't have nothing. It's not enough that people have lost their homes and businesses. Winslow police say they have arrested four people for looting at McCormick's lumber yard. Kathy Ganthner, Channel 5 News, Winslow. In Pittsfield, residents not only worked round the clock to save their own homes, but they banded together to save the Edwards plant. Together, they bagged over 40,000 sandbags and stacked them against the rising Sebastocook River. Back in Bangor, the flood watch had gathered again in downtown for the chance to witness a repeat performance of the plaza flooding. The many banks and businesses that circle Kenduskeg Plaza were closed today. Electricity had been cut for safety purposes. And though hundreds, then thousands of the curious added a carnival atmosphere to the scene, city officials were worried. Uh, the fire department uh, had a couple of pumpers down here, and uh, we've had these small pumps trying to drain the water out. I know the governor is concerned about other areas of the state, and I would assume that he would include any damage in this area along with uh, the other areas of the state. The measuring continued. High tide came. The stream once again licked the edges of the concrete abutments. But by mid-afternoon, officials became optimistic. I really don't expect that it's going over. Though downtown Bangor narrowly escaped another brush with flooding, so many other areas did not. But through it all, a spirit prevailed of mutual aid, of togetherness, of doing unto others when they needed it most. At the Bureau of Civil Emergency Preparedness, Director David Brown was able to give us information today on what people affected by the flood can do to get help and what it means to be declared a disaster area. What it means is that right now, uh, and right now I mean as of Monday upcoming, when the centers for relief will be opened, federal centers, uh, people will begin to be able to process their specific claims for help. Now that we know that this money is going to be made available to us, how do people get to the money? What we're going to be speaking very specifically about starting Monday, when the, s the centers operate through are opened and operate throughout the state, people will be able to go to the centers and find uh, one-stop shopping. They'll be able to find some things in those centers such as Small Business Administration, the Red Cross and Salvation Army people, the uh, federal people, and state officials. State officials representing such agencies as uh, Department of Human Services, the unemployment people, uh, we're truly going to try to make this one-stop shopping for people. Who is going to be able to be helped by this money that's coming to us from the federal government? There definitely will be help for now I should say those who qualify. Uh, the expression that the federal people like to use, and I guess I would echo the same expression, is that no person, no business will be made whole again. We have, all of us have to understand that there is suffering and there will be, there will continue to be some suffering. This agency's role is to attempt to match up the needs with those who can supply those needs. I'm speaking of loans as well as grants. And he is a very busy man these days as a director of civil emergency preparedness. In fact, he's been getting home around 2 in the morning for the last few nights. Just last night, he was in Newport, where the crib dam uh, was uh, crumbling near Lake Sebastocook. They saved uh, that now. They did save that, and uh, he declared today that that dam is secure. Apparently, they had uh, 16. Uh, National Guard trucks there, countless workers working all night, and uh, he has 
been very instrumental in getting this uh, declaration made today, and he's been working very hard. And Monday, Don, a special announcement will be made on where you can go. That's the key. That is the key. People want to know right now, where can we go to get the help to apply for the funds that we need? Those decisions have not been made yet. On Monday, they will make a special announcement where the centers will be set up throughout the state. Important and you can uh, go there. that you obviously go and get the things and the help that you need, but it's also important because you've got 60 days for a lot of these assistance from the uh, Day of Declaration, and that is today, so it's important to get in. And we will have more. Okay, there you are making a major grocery investment. Investing in breads, bananas, blueberries, bagels. And if someone just throws them into the bag, well, you know what happens. At Shop and Save, that doesn't happen. And if it does, you get double your money back. Guarantee. Hey, I'm more than just a bagger. I'm here to protect your investment. Think of me as your banker. A home is one of the best investments you can make. Today, that's more true than ever. And at the Merrill family of banks, we're more ready than ever to help you make the most of your housing investment. We'll help you choose which of our many mortgage programs is right for you. Our statewide system of mortgage representatives provides these high-quality services when and where you need them. And we'll help make the entire process as quick and simple as possible. Make the most of your best investment at the Merrill family of banks. If you're going to spend over $12,000 for a Toyota, or a Honda, or a Volkswagen, or a Subaru, or a Nissan, do you realize you can also afford the front-wheel drive, the tight sports car handling, the logical engineering and driving experience of a Saab 900? See Clyde Billing Incorporated, Saab Atasca, State Street, Augusta. Northern New England's biggest home and garden show. Over 100 exhibitors, new ideas, pools, hot tubs, satellite TV, cable TV, computers and cabinetry, log cabins, condominiums, home furnishings, landscaping and equipment. Get the big picture for spring at the big show. Manchester Lions Home and Garden Show, starting Friday, April 10th at 6 p.m. and continuing Saturday and Sunday. Acres of free parking just off I-95 at the Augusta Civic Center. What a time it has been for a new governor. Governor McKernan, of course, very busy these last few days trying to have Maine declared a disaster area. Today that declaration came through and Felicia spoke with him about what that means and where the state is headed now. And at, that, uh, at this point, we're now, we've just received the presidential declaration so that we uh, will now qualify for FEMA assistance and we'll begin the process of establishing those centers, um, one of which obviously will be in Bangor to service that area, to uh, begin to have people come in and, uh, and demonstrate their damages so we can begin to give people the financial assistance that they're going to need. Governor, give us, if you can, a chronology of the events of the steps that you had to take ever since we entered this flooding episode? Well, the first time that I knew that we were going to have a problem was when I was flying back from Washington on Tuesday the 31st and literally started to descend into Portland only to have the plane pull out, circle for a while, and then tell us that they were going back to Washington because the weather was so bad. And so I got back to Washington Tuesday night, finally got out Wednesday morning, and by then it was clear that we were going to have the flooding. And that's when we originally signed the declaration of emergency, which started the whole process of, uh, of assessing damages as well as trying to uh, uh, deal with evacuation problems and making sure that we protected people's lives, first of all. And once that was sort of concluded after a two-day period, then we have be, been involved for the last, oh, really five or six days in trying to begin the assessment of damages as well as taking care of people's needs, which have been done really through a volunteer effort headed up by the Red Cross. What do you think it's going to take for the state of Maine to recover from all this devastation? Well, obviously it's going to be a time-consuming process, and uh, frankly, it's uh, probably going to be an expensive process, and that's what we have to do is look at the kind of programs that we have available to best meet those needs. We have to divide them into a number of categories. Uh, one are sort of public 
uh, assets that have been destroyed or damaged. And by that I mean those uh, uh, roads, river, uh, bridges that go over rivers, culverts, those types of, of situations where it's really a community uh, owned piece of property or a state owned piece of property. Uh, we intend to make sure that those uh, projects are fully funded and if the federal government does not pick up those projects then the state will pick up those projects, even if they're community assets. We're not going to ask the communities to participate in the matching formula that the federal government requires. The state intends to pick up those matching requirements on municipalities. Then we'll look at individuals. Individuals will fall into a number of categories. One is uh, the grant program. That is going to be done mostly on a need basis and uh, frankly one of the concerns is that a lot of the needs won't be met because of the limitations on those programs so that we will have to look at additional programs, low interest loan programs as well as other basic subsistence and shelter programs that the state can help uh, provide for those people who really slip through the cracks on the federal program. Okay. Now a lot of people in the state of Maine obviously were not prepared with flood insurance. Is there going to be some means of helping them get through this, this financial burden? Well, there are going to be some, uh, some people who are going to be in difficult situations because uh, there are only 3,500 flood insurance policies in this state, it's my understanding. So uh, that means that there will be a number of people uh, who are going to need uh, significant assistance. Even some people with flood insurance will have high deductibles and may not even be able to meet uh, the deductible aspect of their insurance. Uh, we hope that FEMA the Federal Emergency Management Agency will be in a position that they will be able to fill in some of those gaps. But there may also be uh, some insurance policies that don't cover anywhere near the full uh, loss. And that's where we're going to have to have the low interest loan programs to try to help people uh, find the type of dollars they're going to need in order to be able to rebuild houses or to uh, uh, provide the, the kind of shelter that they're going to need. And it's going to be a, uh, a difficult uh, proposition, but we intend to do everything we can to, to help. We've been, we've been fortunate that we've had so many people who have been willing to help during the last 10-day period. And uh, whether it's the Red Cross, or the Salvation Army, or the Mennonites, or just the other private organizations that have stepped in, because we have a period where we have to assess damages as governmental agencies, and then file our request with the president, get the presidential declaration, and then set up the governmental agencies to ultimately provide the relief. But that doesn't address the immediate needs of people who, some of whom have lost everything. And that's where the volunteer agencies ha have stepped in. So we really ought to uh, be uh, thanking those kind of volunteer efforts that have made just an incredible difference in people's lives. The people in, uh, in state government and the local governments have also uh, pulled together and begun to assess those damages. And now that we have received the presidential declaration, we'll be able to open those offices to start to meet the long-term needs of people. So that uh, we just want people to know that uh, we're all in this together. Uh, we intend to help as much as we possibly can from the state level as well as the local level. And what we need to know now is the kind of damages that people have sustained. They just have to come to these centers and let us know or otherwise we won't be able to help. And Don, the governor uh, wanted to point up again, he had high praise for all his staff, his cabinet people, and everyone on the way down on the official side who's been working, and he also had high praise for the volunteers, saying that, uh, of oh, course, we yeah. couldn't have gotten through this without them, and all the people who stuck with this for so many hours. The list of people who should be thanked, uh, gosh, it's terribly long. The uh, work and the worry continued to cross Maine through the weekend as the threat of rain hung in the air. So luckily, the new rainfall was minimal. And as homeowners and business people began cleaning up and tallying up their losses, there were others on hand to help. Many who had been with the flood situation from the beginning, blocking roads, evacuating victims, directing traffic and rescue operations. In towns all across the state, police officers were there to take charge. In the counties, sheriff's deputies were everywhere, ready to assist. Kathy Getha was with some of them last week and reported to us then that their work was non-stop. All deputies and dispatchers have been called in because of the emergency conditions. Sergeant Ralph Holmes and dispatcher Linda Stanhope are answering the phones which have been ringing off the hook since early this morning. Dispatcher Steve Logan has been here since 10 o'clock last night. Possibly two miles from the causeway, we have a barricade set up. He'd like to have you 
10 6 there, stop the traffic there. The road uh, is becoming flooded in three or four places at a time. All deputies are putting in long hours. We're going to have uh, coffee and donuts and, and some uh, food here at the sheriff's office, and if we have to, we'll move it out to various locations in the county so the officers can get some repast and get back to work. What has made things even worse? The Department of Transportation has run out of barricades. Yes, all of our regular barricades have been used up. What are you using now? We're using anything we can get from uh, yellow and orange yellow flagging tape to uh, assi other signs, uh, miscellaneous work, work ahead signs, anything we can get. Another problem, the DOT can't work on washed out roads and potholes that are under several feet of water. Kathy Ganthner, Channel 5 News, Bangor. Cooperative extension workers for the university were mobilized and provided valuable advice to flood victims. Pick up the information package and begin to initiate the kind of cleanup procedures that they need to go through as well as documentation for damage. Public works crews were also working around the clock along with members of the National Guard, called in when the governor declared Maine in a state of emergency. And added to these professionals are the scores of volunteers who helped their neighbors simply because they were needed. You know, Felicia, I have not heard of a single flood caused death in the state of Maine, which is, if there is a positive story, certainly that is the positive story in all this. And the people you just saw, and I guess the credit to all of the people in Maine should be credited with that fact. I that's would say not bad. That's where it goes. We'll be right back. The president for their fast action. Last Friday, when Senator Cohen and I toured Maine with Secretary of Transportation Doe, we saw the devastation that this flooding has caused in many parts of Maine. It is a genuine disaster. The president's prompt response in declaring this a disaster area indicates his understanding of the severity of the problem, and I commend him for it. All Maine people are grateful to President Reagan for his prompt reply to the state's request. So it's very good news for Maine. It's a sharing program, unlike the uh, Secretary Dole's commitment to Maine, which deals with our highway uh, assistance program. That's at 100 percent. This is a cost sharing of 75 percent federal, 25 percent local. But it, uh, it's very good news for the state of Maine. There are seven counties that are currently covered under this application but it can be updated and amended at any time, and I'm sure the governor is going to be uh, really uh, certifying uh, additional counties, uh, such as Lincoln County and others, that will be entitled to, uh, to that relief as well. As always in a disaster, the Red Cross has been mobilized and set up service centers across the state. We have a list of some of the centers for you, should you need any assistance. In Bangor, the service center has been open at the airport mall. Hours are 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., and the center will be open Saturday and Sunday as well. For those in the Guilford, Dover, Foxcroft, Milo area, the Red Cross Center located in the Superior Court building in Dover, Foxcroft. Again, open daily, 9 to 6. Waterville, you can go to the Waterville Armory for Red Cross assistance. In the capital, the service center is at the Penny Memorial Baptist Church. Now, of course, because of Sunday church services, you should call the church or the Red Cross for the Sunday hours. The Wyndham Community Center will be the Red Cross headquarters there. In Rumford, assistance can be obtained at the Rumford Armory. You should call there, too, for Sunday hours. And a new center was opened today in Saco for flood victims there. Diana Creasy is uh, one of the uh, Red Cross representatives in Bangor at the airport mall, the center in Bangor. Diana, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, you've given me some of the numbers that uh, of the people who have come by there and the people who have come by. 86 families have been helped there at the center. Uh, across the state, 512, but I know you were telling me earlier, you're a little bit bothered that there are not a lot more. Yes, that's right. Uh, we're very concerned that we are, have not had more of the people who we know have been affected because of our damage assessment figures. Uh, we've only had about 25% of, of a very uh, sizable number of people that we would have expected to be in here. We're anxious for them to come in and identify their situations to us. There are, various, uh, there are varieties of assistance available, um, covering food, clothing, shelter, medical uh, needs, and occupational needs. At the very least, the Red Cross cleaning kit is famous right. across the country. Yes, yes, it has earned quite a reputation. The disinfectant alone, I understand, is worth the trip to come and pick it up. Uh, yeah, that's been very helpful for, to people to try to deal with the mess that they have to cope with. Don, I'd like to add that at the airport mall, the Sunday hours will be one till six. 
one until six. That's right. We, uh, I don't know that you mentioned it. If you did, it's worth mentioning again. The Red Cross services for the victims are free. That is absolutely right. All of these services come as a result of the cash and money donations of the American people all across the country. Uh, and this is going on, this has gone on for years and years. It's a tradition. It's just neighbor helping neighbor. At the same time, there will be other disasters and you need help at this time and donations. Absolutely. If anyone uh, would like to make a cash donation or check, they can send it to their local Red Cross chapter or they can call a 1-800 number that we have, uh, which would result in them being sent a card and an envelope. That number is 1-800-4, uh, it's right behind me, 453-9000. Diana, thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your help. Thank you. Now, after this cleanup process, uh, after the flood, rather, you have the process, which is long and difficult, sometimes even discouraging, but we have a couple of suggestions for you when you reach the manageable stage of cleaning up. Among the do's and don'ts for taking care of your uh, house, do remove as much of the water as possible by uh, bailing and mopping and soaking with sponges and disconnect any appliances in the houses, including TVs and radios. You should cut any electrical circuits, especially in the basement area. Again, try to get as much water out of the house as you can and do try to combat the mold and mildew by using a fan or a dehumidifier and get as much fresh air into the house as possible. But under the don't category, remember, don't use a normal household vacuum cleaner to try to get the water up. If you need to vacuum, get a vacuum cleaner meant to use with water. These can be rented at most rental shops. Don't pump the water out of your cellar until the standing water around your home is receded. Otherwise, you may have trouble with the foundation. And also very important, don't leave the pump unattended if you are pumping your, your basement. And don't leave any heavy furniture on the carpets. Try to remove it or raise it until the carpet dries. And again, if you want to get into the uh, Red Cross, go there. You're not alone in this. A lot of people are uh, in the same condition, so go, and they will help you. And finally, tonight, we'd like to leave you with uh, one more look at not only the destruction we've undergone through this flood, but also with some images of the power and the majesty of nature. Good night.
least since early this week when we uh, decided to do this special program tonight. And I think all during last week, you, tr you get wrapped up in the drama uh, that's all going on. And obviously, there's a news story going on on every street corner. I've covered hurricanes. They're much like that. You try to think of what do you say to the people who are victimized by the flood, but how do you put yourself in the shoes of someone who has lost their home? Especially in a situation like this, because as uh, one of our reporters had mentioned earlier in the week, you have no control over it. There's nothing you can do. This is an act of nature, an act of God, and all you can do is stand by, watch, and eventually deal with it. You work all your life. You work you scratch and you claw and you accumulate a few things and in one fleeting moment they're gone. Our hearts went out to you. Our hearts go out to you tonight. I don't know what else to say. We'll be back in a moment. Casco Northern Bank, in keeping with its long-standing tradition of supporting the communities of Maine, is offering special loan rates for area flood victims. Borrowers needing money for post-flood rebuilding will receive special rates on home improvement loans and commercial loans. The bank has also been contacting civic officials in the affected areas to pledge its support and keep abreast of the situation. Casco Northern Branch personnel stand ready to help in any way they can and will give top priority to flood-related loan requests. Hi, and Edwina wanted a family in the worst way. I need a baby high. They got more than you handle. So they borrowed one. <laughs> and the fun has just begun. Oh. Oh. 